introduce our speakers. So today we're gonna have uh, Drew go first. And then we're gonna jump into let uh, Rhett present. So let's, let's introduce you to Rhett. Uh, so he's been a nurse for four years. Or you want me to go Drew? No, you're fine. Do you see okay. this one? Sorry, everybody. Yeah. It started with Rhett and then you changed it on me. There I know. <laughs> All right, so sorry. He has served across med surge, pediatric, LTAC and for the past two years in our surgical ICU unit. Uh, he has both the CCRN and TCRN. Uh, he served as a senior OEC technician for the National Ski Patrol for the past six years, uh, including two. Uh, he is AV1 certified as well as certified in mountain travel and rescue. Uh, he's been an avid outdoorsman for the last 30 years. So fantastic. Welcome, Rhett. Thank you for giving us your time today. And then we're also going to hear from Drew Hardesty. Sorry, bring that up. Uh, he's been a forecaster with the Utah Avalanche Center since 1999. After receiving a BA in political science from the University of Colorado in Boulder, he took a commission with the U.S. Navy as an intelligence officer in the first desert storm. Subsequent to working abroad, he spent a number of years working and guiding for NOLS and Outward Bound in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and Alaska. He now spends his summers as a climbing ranger in the Grand Teton National Park and went to Washington, D.C. in 2012 to receive a Valor Award for his partner rescue of 17 lightning strike victims near the summer of Grand Teton. 17 is a lot of victims, Drew. Uh, he's <laughs> often described as a storyteller at the Forecast Center, infusing his forecast with haiku, metaphor, and allegory. I can't say that one, allegory. Uh, you'll often find <laughs> reference to the Book of Job, Cormac McCarthy, the Whale Hunter, Herman Melville, the Dry Fisherman, Dry Fly Fisherman, Norman McLean, the French Aviator, Antoine de and I can't say that last name. <laughs> Drew's going to have to pronounce that one for me. Because I can't, but lots of great experience coming your way today, guys. So thank you for joining us. And without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Drew to start his presentation and hopefully pronounce that name for me because I got nothing. Uh, you have all probably read The Little Prince, uh, St. Exupery. Most people um, think of him as a children's author, but that's, that's, that's not the case. Um, he has a wonderful collection of, of books about just life and flying. You know, he's an aviator. I think he was shot down in World War I. Uh, maybe I'll see if I can share my screen here. Uh, wish me good luck. Let's see, we are up to six avalanche fatalities in the state. Um, we average uh, a little over three in Utah each winter. Six is a lot. Uh, in fact, the quadruple fatality that many of you are aware of, and maybe even some of you uh, are friends or family with some of the people involved. Uh, that was the most significant avalanche uh, in the central Wasatch since, well, since we've been keeping records, 1941. Uh, the most significant avalanche in the state since 1992. Um, we nationally are up to 31 avalanche fatalities. I think uh, one yesterday in Grand Teton National Park. I think we're up to 26 since February 1st. Um, I will just try to run through some uh, basic avalanche awareness and then probably hit some Q&A towards the end. And um, beware, it might be me asking the questions of you. <laughs> so avalanches are what we call equal opportunity killers. Uh, they don't really discriminate on uh, type of recreation, age, gender, ethnicity, religious preference. Uh, the avalanche doesn't care. And, uh, we see that most of our fatalities are skier snowboarder, but snowmobilers, snow bikers, as it were, are a close second and are even, they've even caught up to skier snowboarders in the last uh, 15 years alone. Something else too, many people assume that uh, like in a cartoon, people are just sort of minding their own business and the avalanche just comes down from above. And that's not really the case. Uh, we choose to be in the avalanche terrain that kills us, um, as you can see with the statistic there. So a couple of points that we just want to really impress 
upon people and they are very basic, uh, but even the experts, the advanced people always come back down to these different points here. And it's critical and incumbent upon us to get the gear, to get the training. And I'll add on, you got to get the forecast, get the picture. What's the big picture of how the avalanche conditions are in the backcountry, And then terrain selection, getting out of harm's way. And I'll hit on a couple points with each uh, as we move through here. Um, a key point, you know, what is an avalanche? It's, uh, there are two main types, you know, one would be what we call loose snow avalanche. It just, that would be like, uh, like sugar on a steep slope where there's just no in, internal strength at all. And just with the angle of a pose, uh, it just will slough down the hillside. But the avalanches that kill us are what we call these slab avalanches. It's a cohesive plate of snow that shatters like a pane of glass on that strong layer over a weak layer um, that runs down the hillside. Uh, this was almost a fatal avalanche just out, outside of Solitude Resort in Big Cottonwood just a couple years ago. I think this is really a great example of what it feels like. It's like being in an avalanche. It's not unlike uh, for many of you boaters in there that have flipped your raft or had to swim in a, in a class five rapid, you really have very little control over what happens to you. Um, also, there's sort of this misunderstanding of like where avalanches occur. You know, you look at the pictures here and you think, oh, wow, that's really dramatic avalanche terrain. But if you look at the, the photo there behind the truck, that killed a BYU student uh, maybe a decade ago. And that's, that's just really uh, less than 100 yards away from the parking lot. I mean, it comes down to physics. Most fatalities occur on slopes between, say, 35 and 40 degrees. And and that, that picture there, that snowshoer that was walking underneath that path triggered the avalanche and, and washed, the, washed them into the stream bed. And, and that's really all it took. Most avalanche accidents occur uh, in the backcountry out of bounds. Um, this statistic here is a bit misleading because this is nationwide. The numbers that I put together recently uh, were that, uh, I guess we're up to 36 avalanche fatalities in the last 20 years involving skiers and boarders. Um, half of them are from people leaving the ski area, half. And half of those happen to be leaving um, the Canyon Ski Resort to go up to 99.90 or out of bounds from there. So the problem that we have in Utah is that many people are stepping out of bounds and they're stepping into considerable or high danger without really recognizing that. Avalanches come in all sizes. Some are very large and can take out buildings, even small cities, and some are really quite small, just sort of a function of the terrain and the snowpack. Again, it's critical when you're looking at, at uh, avalanche terrain, it all, all comes down to slope steepness. You know, 30 to 45 degrees, there in the middle you can see is really prime time. Um, the problem with that, uh, and I know many of you are, are probably expert riders and skiers in the room, that's, as you know, you know, riding the chairs in the backcountry, that's the terrain that we like to recreate on. It's, it's just also the sweet spot for powder skiing. And for many of us, that's why we're here. So just looking at what we call West Bowl of Silver Fork here, um, you can see what terrain is steep enough to slide. And it's kind of that gut there, almost 40 degrees, right, at the, right up there at the top. Hmm. Gentler terrain that's off to the side on either side, a little bit more gentle, but there is, what we say with hard slabs, if that, that plate of snow is really hard, that can propagate wildly uh, up to even a quarter mile or half mile wide. 
Um, there are some times when avalanches, due to that sort of propagation propensity, as we say, if there's a lot of strength in that slab, it can also rip out to lower angle terrain as well, sort of above or adjacent to that main avalanche. Also some other terrain considerations, you know, if you are caught in the avalanche, the question you need to ask is what will happen to me um, is after I'm caught in the avalanche, what, where's the terrain I'm headed? You might end up in a steep walled gully where things can pile up deeply on top of you. You might get washed through the trees, breaking all of your bones. Um, it just may be significant trauma because the avalanche path is three, four or 5,000 feet or over cliffs and rock bands um, there on the left, lower left hand and um, uh, portion of your screen. And that's Elk Point down in the Provo Area Mountains. And that was the site of the fatality, I believe in 04, that killed the three kids. And that was really the watershed moment to create the Know Before You Go program. Quickly, how do avalanches form? As we always say that uh, the weather is the architect of the avalanches. And you know, over the course of the winter, we see different wind events and storm events. Sometimes we see these frost layers, which are what we call surface hoar. It's all about structure and sort of the geology within the snowpack. And it's really key to know what's going on underneath your feet. We're looking and trying to map out different when weak I'm layers. Around in the mountains, I like to think of weak layers like a great white shark lurking just beneath the snow surface. You always need to be thinking what's underneath. Take this cross section of the snowpack. You may be walking in a flat meadow and get the weak layer to collapse and it might make a really loud noise. But the snow didn't move anymore. That's a huge red flag. In fact, you just triggered an avalanche. That same snowpack, if you were to tilt it up to say 35 degrees, why would get rid of that? You can see here just very clearly if you have strong over weak, I mean, it's very clear. If you dig down in the mountains now, you have to dig deeper. You're going to see a snowpack not unlike that. And so that is avalanche forecasters. That's that's our whole picture is to try to determine the stratigraphy and looking at the snowpack layering to to combine that with uh, you know the weather that's expected to come up with an overall danger rating for the backcountry. So folks can make good decisions as they head into the steep terrain. Kevin Grove out in Bend got very lucky with that one here. So the ingredients that you need for an avalanche here, you need a slab, again, that cohesive plate of snow, something weaker underneath it. Um, you need a slope steep enough to slide and then you need a trigger and that trigger generally is us. So the things for us to do again is to get the gear, get the forecast, get the training, get the picture and get out of harm's way. I'll, I'll, I'll hit that again in just a minute. Uh, I think Red's gonna talk a bit more about that in a little bit, but most of our fatalities are owing to asphyxiation. Uh, traumatic injury accounts for about a quarter. I, I think those numbers are a little skewed depending on whether you're looking at North America or Europe, but that, that's a rough approximation here. You really don't have that long to survive uh, under the snow. Generally about 15 minutes is, is that threshold. The take home is that you cannot call the cavalry. Um, by the time even that helicopter gets spooled up, um, it's your long past 15 minutes. You are um, with your partners in the back entry. You are the cavalry. You need to go and acquire that signal um, probe them and then dig them up within 15 minutes. So again, the gear is critical. The beacon, the shovel, the probe. There are other doodads and things that can sort of help with your vulnerability as it were out there. Avalanche airbags, Breco reflectors, which uh, uh, can, can be um, uh, found uh, with, with different uh, mechanisms that the ski areas and SAR teams have. Um, but having all this gear can help 
uh, survival. You'll see Trent here, he's sort of pulling this avalanche airbag. Um, these are pretty useful, you know, it's uh, uh, in a way they um, are like personal flotation devices or, or uh, uh, your PFDs, if you're in that river, it's gonna help your buoyancy uh, to, to be oversimplified, to keep you on top of that flowing debris pile. Um, and the statistics are, are worth worth uh, looking at. They, they save about half the lives that would otherwise be killed uh, in a serious avalanche accident, trauma notwithstanding. Um, if you don't have a beacon, uh, <laughs> then you're buried underneath uh, 15 to 20 feet of snow and it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. That was a double fatality, I think also in 0405 in, in Mineral Fork with Big Cottonwood Canyon. Again, we talked about these reco reflectors. A lot, of, a lot of gear, boots, pants, Gore-Tex jackets have those uh, in um, sort of in the gear themselves and, and you're more easily to be found. But once again, by the time they bring in the reflector, it's generally past 15 minutes. Sometimes the helicopter can't fly at all. So again, you need to be able to be the own, your own rescue team. We do put out avalanche forecasts uh, seven days a week, generally from November through April. Um, there are many avalanche forecast centers across the West. Uh, we do have a, a one to five point scale from low to extreme. Um, counterintuitively, most of our avalanche fatalities occur during considerable and sometimes moderate danger. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Most people are not out in high or extreme. And then more people, more and more people are getting out during moderate and uh, and considerable. Um, on our forecast, we 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 uh, tease apart the different types of avalanche problems. We tell you what they are, where they are, your likelihood of triggering them, and how big they're going to be. And then we have the fine print, uh, as always, sort of as part of the forecast. Um, obvious clues are often part of uh, the the big picture when avalanche conditions are significant, you're gonna see other avalanches, but uh, other tracks on the slope doesn't mean that things are safe. Um, cracking, collapsing, other avalanches. So here's, a, here's our five red flags. Um, recent avalanches, crack, shooting cracks, hearing that thunderclap of a collapse. Um, you know, winds are just as much, if not more of a player for avalanche uh, foundation, you know, heavy snowfall, you know, the, the big picture is the snowpack does not like rapid change and rapidly rising temperatures are also uh, uh, fundamental to that as well. You know, what we do choose, if we don't choose the weather or the snowpack, we do choose our terrain. So it's key to be able to recognize if you're on, above, or beneath uh, avalanche terrain. Um, we also choose the way in which we travel through that terrain. So it only expose one person to steep terrain at a time. Uh, as we're seeing more people getting into the backcountry, the other thing is, of course, we all take into consideration our own levels of acceptable risk, but uh, we're seeing more and more people triggering avalanches over other parties, infrastructure, roads, and so forth. So big picture, if you want to head in the backcountry, you got to know before you go, you got to get the gear, the training, the forecast, the picture, and then get out of harm's way. Um, and so that's it in a nutshell. Thanks so much. Thank you, Drew. Do you guys have any questions for Drew? You can put them in the chat. Uh, you can come off mute. Uh, like I said, following them. Drew, is you, do you guys have a, is it the Twitter hashtag? Is it just the um, know before you go? Uh, UT Avi is our Twitter. Okay. Uh, and then also on Instagram and then Facebook. Okay. Uh, and I know the Utah Avalanche Center is UAC Wasatch, I believe, at UAC Wasatch. Yeah. Um, and Drew, you said um, get the training. Where do you suggest they get additional training? And where can they go for that? Yep, there's a lot of great free training um, out there. And then uh, there's other training, your level one, your level two, and so forth. 
You can find all that stuff on our website on, under the education bar, Utah Avalanche Center. Dot org. You'll find a, a list of course schedules and providers and dates and and so on and so forth. Um, so I really encourage you to, if you're going to step into the backcountry, um, I really highly encourage sort of get, getting the education because we know what the stakes are. So one other question I have, you know, with this year, there's a lot more people who are out snowshoeing in the backcountry and snowshoeing in areas who have you know, I've been a snowshoer for a long time and I've never taken the avalanche training course. I feel like I go in safe areas, but I think that's, I'm realizing it's just so dangerous that the snowshoers should also consider getting training. And, you know, I don't know about gear or whatnot, but what's your thoughts on the snowshoeing population? Yes, I know. I mean, sometimes we show these, uh, you know, you see these rad videos and you know, and, and many people are like, well, that, I mean, that's, that's really cool, but that, like, that's not me, you know, like I'm not in that terrain. And yet, again, I, you know, one, a couple of the slides I showed is that it, it doesn't matter, like if you're on a 40 degree slope or underneath a 40 degree slope, it doesn't matter if it's, the slope is 100 feet tall or 5,000 feet tall. I mean, it's, it does not matter. I mean, the, the BYU kid just right there out of the parking lot if you are near steep terrain, um, avalanches need to be on your radar. And the gear is what I'm hearing. Well, yes, I mean, not to like- Depending on where you go, I, I'm assuming, but- Well, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, you have to have the gear. If you're gonna be near anywhere that is steep, again, because you have to, pull off the rescue and you have to be found. Uh, many people think, oh, I'm not gonna get into that, but they, what they call, they drift into failure. They drift into that terrain. Um, the other thing is, you know, many of you will understand this, but this idea is of like risk uh, homeostasis, you know, like when they had like interlock brakes and seat belts and they did the studies, did they find that there were fewer accidents? They found that people tailgated more. That, that, uh, you know, you feel like you, you are invulnerable because you have all the stuff that's gonna protect you, but it's like wearing your seat belt with a head on with a Mack truck in some mm -hmm. situations. Oh, great, thank you. Awesome, does anybody else have any more questions for Drew? All right, if you guys think of any, again, just put them in the chat uh, and then we will turn it over to Rhett. Thanks so much. Thank you, Drew. All right, thank you, Drew. That was actually a really great lecture. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about, we're kind of following up on Drew's lecture there about avalanches in the first aid, what to do and or, or maybe what not to do um, in kind of the, the studying and looking into my personal and professional experiences with avalanches. Drew's lecture is probably the most important to pay attention to rather than this one here on the first aid. Um, don't get caught in an avalanche and you don't ever have to do the first aid, essentially. So some of the objectives we're gonna talk about like identifying common injuries associated with avalanches, um, being able to, turn, to determine what uh, changes you should make to the gear. I noticed on that poll on the survey that a about half of you do not carry or maybe sometimes carry first aid kits. Um, I would definitely change that to carrying at least the basic first aid and just a couple of really handy things. And we'll, we'll discuss that later. And then also recognizing the first aid that may be needed or that may be utilized in some of these situations. Um, so there are, in my opinion, two basic rules of the outdoors. One, have fun, and two, be safe. Um, all of us love the outdoors. All of us love the back country. If you want to really enjoy winter, especially here in Utah, playing in the snow is almost a key component of that. But the safety aspect of things, the more safe you tend to be, the longer and more fun you can typically have in the snow. Um, just a few avalanche statistics. 
avalanche ranges. This is from the Colorado Avalanche Center over the last 10 years. Um, and in working for the University of Utah, we are a trauma one center that facilitates um, first aid or not first, but uh, primary care to several states, being Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, Nevada. And it was interesting to see some of the statistics coming out from all the different big avalanche states. There were a few more avalanche states noted that I didn't put up here, but like Washington. Um, or again in California also have quite a few avalanches. Um, and one thing that was fun to realize is Nevada, even though we don't ever think of Nevada much other than um, Las Vegas, did have still one avalanche fatality in the last 10 years. So definitely going along with Drew's lecture, don't always think that you're safe, be cognizant of your surroundings and be aware that avalanches can happen in many different areas. Now, the causes of death range a little bit, and it looks like my statistics are even a little bit different from Drew's statistics that he just had. But we can see that asphyxiation accounts for about 65 to 70% of fatalities, then followed up by trauma, which is about 29 to 30%. Oops, sorry. Um, and of that 30-ish of that percent, Multi-system trauma makes up 38%. Head trauma makes up a 31%. Spinal trauma comes in at 19. And then a other category of 12%. And then finally, with the total cause of death, um, you have another category that includes certain things like drowning, hypothermia, and primary cardiac arrest prior to the avalanche um, causing any further damage. So biggest key component of avalanches is suffocation, suffocation, suffocation. If you were, if you were looking at um, Drew's slide there, 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, expectancy of not only life, but quality of life after an avalanche begins to greatly diminish and fall off. Um, and of course, this leads to a, a avalanche lead to a plethora of issues with burial, uh, access to getting to somebody and finding people. If you're buried a few inches from the surface, whereas if you're buried 20 feet from the surface, sometimes it may take a while for friends to find you, dig you out, or for you to find your friends. Um, with the thought of asphyxiation being a huge problem and knowing that just the sheer mechanism of injury associated with huge avalanches, I want you to all get in the habit of just thinking of help. I know that, that during Drew's lecture, he talked about, um, it's gonna take a while for help to get there. You are the primary help for at least 45, maybe an hour and a half, um, or even longer for professional help to arrive. But in delaying that help, you could be even further out. So as soon as you see an avalanche, I would automatically just be thinking of like, okay, I need to call for help. I need to send somebody for help. I need somehow to get the help coming to arrive. Because even after you dig a person out, even after you may have performed a lot of the basic and initial first aid, there's still going to be a lot of things that need to be taken care of after. Um, so with asphyxiation and with suffocation being a very primary component of fatality in avalanches, I would call for that help. And then also begin to looking um, into your own personal training of just basic life support. Uh, BLS, including knowing how to do rescue breathing and CPR. This uh, fatality due to asphyxiation usually comes from a cardiopulmonary arrest secondary to hypoxemia. A lot of times you're seeing that all of these people go into cardiac arrest due to just being so severely hypooxygenated. Their oxygen just drops too low, their heart gives out, and then they die. 
if you can simply just correct that oxygenation, you give them enough time that their heart and um, the rest of their body can kind of go into survival mode and hopefully get them through the aftermath of trauma. Um, I did put a picture on here of both a head tilt chin lift and a jaw thrust. And in the avalanche patient, a jaw thrust is the preferred method of opening an airway. A lot of times avalanche victims may become unconscious, knocked unconscious, or uh, may have all of a sudden, or not all of a sudden, sorry, may have gotten to the point where their oxygen is already too low to be able to mentate enough to keep their airway open. So a lot of times they just need a little bit of assistance with their airway being opened. If you can open that airway, sometimes that's enough to correct the asphyxiation problem that you're having. Now the head tilt chin lift is great and most often preferred for CPR. However, in a trauma and especially in an avalanche victim, I would heavily encourage you to always use the jaw thrust for the reason coming up as we switch to the second reason of injuries. Multi-system trauma. Um, avalanches can reach speeds of up to 200 miles an hour and can hit an individual with the force of a midsize sedan. This can lead to just a wide variety of injuries that you're seeing. And oftentimes, a avalanche victim never comes out saying like, oh, well, you know, like I rolled my ankle and I got buried in the snow and that was all. Um, a lot of the times the ones we're seeing that make it to the hospital that actually do survive not only have uh, severe hypooxygenation issues that we have to correct, but broken bones, broken um, extremities, ribs, neck, they have uh, multiple brain injuries, including like certain brain bleeds that are affecting them. They can have a lot of puncture wounds from debris and damage that's in the avalanche. Um, and just all sorts of other things. So that's kind of why the jaw, going back to the jaw thrust is important. A person who is in an avalanche, it should be just primarily assumed that they have something else probably wrong with them other than just the primary issue you're seeing. So if you can just automatically assume that, hey, maybe the big floppy head that's on top of their body supported by a rather small spinal column may have been injured. So making sure that you don't manipulate their head a ton, make sure they're not moving their head all over and make sure that you're trying to stabilize that neck. Uh, certainly the cervical spine itself is very important in these trauma patients. It's, it's amazing to hear stories and see some examples of people who had a very traumatic injury and were so focused on maybe the chest or a lower extremity that they forgot about their head. And as they were moving their head, caused further damage and wound up being a quadriplegic or a, another fatality on the statistics marker rather than just having to worry about whatever else was going on. Um, so remember that like splinting, securing and stabilizing are super key components in the pre-hospital setting and incredibly important in your avalanche first aid. The picture on the right of the screen there is of just a simple sling over the arm. Um, oftentimes, as people are being rolled around and tumbling down a mountainside, arms and legs, uh, anything that's kind of attached to the trunk is some of the first things to break. And with all fractures and all musculoskeletal injuries, a big um, first aid tip is just, just like to stabilize it, secure it. Bones, once they are broken, don't ever like to stay in the same place. They move around, they bounce around, people start moving and try and, and bones just start to move. Now that becomes a bigger problem because 
bones, as soon as they're broken, become very, very sharp. They can start cutting through blood vessels, muscle, tissue, um, and anything that stands in their way. A simple closed fracture of the radius or ulna is very minor. And if it's splinted, you can fix it and correct it. And somebody can be back on their way within a couple weeks to a couple months, start performing things again regularly. However, you take that same fracture unsplinted in a patient who is going to be transported out of the back country by a snowmobile or by a helicopter, be dug out from an avalanche, be moved around, jostled in any way, you can have that same radius and ulna fracture begin to cut through va vasculature, cut through muscle, um, and cause enough problems that you could see somebody losing the limb or possibly even leading to a greater fatality should they start to have enough damage within just the forearm of the human body. So make sure as soon as you're seeing a lot of these simple injuries, the broken leg, the broken arm, broken whatever, make sure to splint it, stabilize it, and protect it. With um, all splinting, the key component of splinting is immobilizing the joint both above and below the injured site. So in the person in the lower right-hand screen, let's say he has that radial or ulnar fracture, you can see there that his wrist is immobilized as well as his elbow, both protecting the joints around the injured bone themselves and causing more injury. Um, a few notes while you're going through and thinking of all of these like uh, first aid tips, head and neck injuries. I feel like over the last 10, 15 years, a lot of research has come out about concussions, head injuries, brain bleeds, and everything else. And we've begun to notice that with head and neck injuries, we should never take them as mild or just like, oh, shrug them off. Um, head injuries often appear normal at first, and then the patient will progressively decline. This is due to the fact that you're dealing with a multi-system trauma patient. And often, if you have a patient that just rolled 1,000 feet down a cliff side, um, gets digged out of the avalanche, they may be very, very concerned about their broken femur. That femur may be causing a ton of pain. It may be very noticeable and all of their distraction may be there, but they may not notice the small epidural sub or subarachnoid bleed that's going on in the brain. They can't see it. They know they have a headache, but that could be associated to disorientation of rolling down a mountain. That could be uh, chalked up to a a billion different reasons. And you'll see people completely skip over the head, start focusing on the broken extremity, the injured site or whatever else. And you'll start to see patients go from talking and appearing like they're going to be just fine to comatose and progressing to bigger issues going on down the road. So automatically with the polytrauma multi- organ trauma victims, we should always be concerned like, okay, their head, um, their, their head is definitely probably injured in all of this. And if I can protect that and make sure that they're um, stabilized in their neck region, things, my outcomes are probably going to be a little bit better. A uh, quick note on ski helmets and snowmobile helmets and all of the helmets. Helmets have become a lot more popular in the last 20 years across all these snow sports and definitely in the back country. The helmet um, has been decreasing to the point of almost non-existent for a lot of our basic head injuries, minor concussions and things like that. However, they are noticing in the large trauma injuries and rolling down a mountain, 
they're not having as great of an effect. So don't assume right off the bat because your buddy had a helmet on and you dug them out that their head is fine and safe. Um, always keep an eye on it and, and try to make sure that you're thinking of the head. Um, unfortunately, there's not a ton of first aid you can provide if you do have a brain bleed or issues going on. It just goes back to calling for that help and stabilizing the neck. Uh, as soon as your help can get there, you can get them to a trauma center where a lot of us can start working on head issues and um, all of the brain bleeds. We can rush them off to surgery. We can do a lot of decompression methods, but it all comes right back to time. If you get them to a hospital quicker, they're gonna be a lot better off. Um, finally, another quick note on our other category of hypothermia. Hypothermia, as it's being researched over the last, gosh, uh, 70, 80 years, most of it primarily coming from World War II, actually. Nazi Germany did a lot of research on hypothermia um, unethically, but that presented a lot of great stuff. We're starting to see that hypothermia is actually a key component in what we call the diamond of death in the trauma world. Our patients who come in as a polytrauma uh, victim often present with this diamond of death that can progress to fatality or progress to a lot greater injuries. The diamond includes hypothermia, coagulopathy, calcium. Um, oh my gosh, I'm having a, a brain fart here for a second. I apologize as I'm trying to look at my notes really quick. And acidosis. acidosis. Sorry. Wow. Um, so all of these things tend to build off one another and starts to cause greater bleeding problems in our polytrauma victims. So this person comes in after an avalanche has head problems, broken extremities, and all sorts of other things. They're probably bleeding from somewhere and something. This can be worsened by hypothermia that starts to mess up your coag coagulopathy issues. It can be worsened by your acidosis and of course your calcium. Um, there's not a lot that you can do in the first aid setting to fix your coagulopathy or your acidosis, but you can help your hypothermia. Patients who just roll down a mountain probably have snow in every single crevice and every single orifice and everywhere set around them, packed in tight. And then you're also looking at the fact that they're going to be laying in the snow, buried in the snow for a while. It go, going, going a bit again, right back to Drew's lecture. If it's going to be taking 45 or minutes or longer and much longer, maybe you don't even get a helicopter. You're going to be in the snow in very cold conditions in the back country for a long time. Trying to prevent hypothermia and correcting hypothermia may be a very critical key in saving a life. And so please always remember like no matter what other injuries are sustained, just start treating for that hypothermia. You're gonna cause uh, a lot better outcomes. You're gonna help us in the hospital setting, be able to help your, your friends, family, whomever. And things are gonna be better all around. And often hypothermia is just one of those small first aid things that are, huge in the end. So remember to keep warm or rewarm slowly. If you're ever in the situation where maybe you were an avalanche, but there's this massive cabin five feet away, please don't grab a patient and your, your victim, your trauma victim, and just throw them in a tub of like really, really warm water. That can always send a person right into shock. And then of course you're fighting many other issues or injuries going on. So remember, just to rewarm slowly, but definitely always try to keep warm. So in going along with all the first aid that we've talked about, 
a few gear ideas that I would definitely recommend along with always when you're in the back country or when you're in avalanche terrain, carrying a small, simple first aid kit, carrying these few small things that can make a difference. And uh, please keep in mind, I'm not um, endorsed by any of these companies. So if there's a better company or better equipment out there, please buy whatever you wish or utilize whatever you want. Um, but a few of the ones like hand warmers, just going along with hypothermia, uh, hot hands, I think has been around for forever. I feel like I used those as a kid. They make hundreds of different sizes between hands, feet. And sometimes they, I, I feel like last time I searched their site, they made a few emergency ones that are larger. They, they don't take up a ton of room in a first aid pack or in a backpack that you're skiing with, but they can provide tons of warmth to you. They can prevent um, hypothermia. They can help prevent hypothermia. They can prevent frostbite. They can keep just small areas really warm. So if you're facing hypothermia, a couple hot hands, um, hand warmers in the armpits or in the groin area can help keep that core warm and help sustain your heat for a lot longer. Um, your cravats or triangular bandages are a key for splinting and stabilization. Your splints, um, Sam is a great medical company that created hundreds of different splints, tourniquets, and pelvic slings. They're foldable, adjustable, x-rayable. They're, they're really awesome. And then adjustable ski poles. If you research like the military, uh, indications for adjustable ski poles. There's a billion different first aid things you can do with adjustable ski poles. The best of which is of course, making really great splints. So I definitely recommend adjustable ski poles for sure. Um, but please, please be safe in the, the back country. Please continue to have fun. Um, and please take care of others. Uh, and remember, there's lots of lots of fun avalanche train that's skiable. This is actually a picture overlooking the backside of Beaver Mountain in northern Utah. There, standing over and looking at some of the 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 shoot to my left. There actually had slid, I think, the day before this picture was taken. So please have fun and please be safe. Let's see. What I That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rhett. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Rhett? I know that they've talked about uh, that they make a body warmer size now. So your whole body warmer instead of just hand warmers, I'm guessing. Um, I need those for the youths games when they actually start again. That would be nice. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions for Rhett, Drew had to jump off, um, but please go ahead and come off mute, put it in the chat. Drew, do you know what percentage, I mean, Rhett, do you know what percentage of um, Avalanche victims actually, you know, when we have 23 deaths or th up to 36 in Utah now over the last X number of years, what percentage of avalanches, you know, are there, you know, are coming into the ER or coming in and, and getting not dying, but having significant in injuries? Are there, do you, do you have any idea of what that number is or if there's been <sighs> increases or changes? Um, I, I was trying to look through and try to find that it, it varied a ton and I wasn't able to find a very clear definitive number. Yeah. It was like it for those who received significant trauma made it to the hospital. It was looking like around 20 or less percent. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that 50 50 right down the middle of the line either survive or are a fatality. Of the 50% that survive, about 30, 35% of them wound up with minor injuries um, that almost didn't need hospitalization, but then the other like 20% or less were coming in and making it to the hospital. And as so it sounds like it must be that, you know, those who are not in the line of fire basically of the avalanche and are able to survive or get out or not be affected when there's an avalanche, the survival is higher. You know, if you just can either not trigger it or be on the side or be in the right spot by chance, but that 
I would imagine things like hypothermia would be for people who are out, outdoors longer, maybe rescuing others or whatnot would be one of the significant injuries. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a little humbling and scary to notice the statistics of it, it's much, much better to not, not ever be in an avalanche than to be in it. It's a harrowing experience from what it looks like. That's why I just like to be in a lodge in a hot tub somewhere, not on the mountain. It's fine. All right. It looks like we got most everybody that's answered the poll. So if you haven't, like I said, go ahead and answer that. Um, and again, oh, favorite by far is the airbag. Uh, Florida girl who loves skiing, you're fantastic. At least you're getting some snow um, here in Utah because it took a few months for us to get to where we needed to be. Uh, but yeah, just go ahead and like I said, finish the poll. Thank you so much, Rhett. Um, I'll shout out to Drew, even though he's not on here. Thank you guys for joining us. Like I said, I think this is really important uh, safety tips for everybody to know. Again, this will be recorded, so everybody will get a chance to view that link. If you want to view any of our other winter series, go ahead. And then if you have any options or thoughts for our spring uh, injury prevention series, let us know. Other than that, we will give you back a few minutes of your day. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much.